Great. Um, welcome. Uh, nice that you're here. Um, I welcome welcome all of you here in Silent Green um, and all of you at home, watching at home. Um, welcome to the second of three events in the discussion series, Nature is Not Natural, AIDS, Collectivity, Radioactivity. This is Derek Jarman here. And that I played um, um, uh, Think Pink from Funny Face, uh, Stanley Donan, I believe the director, um, with Kay Thompson singing the song that Derek Jarman uses in the garden. I'm Mark Siegel. And I've had the pleasure of organizing these uh, three events in the context of this um, fantastic exhibition project inspired by, dedicated to, and departing from Derek Jarman's film, The Garden. And again, I thank Bettina Ellekamp, Jörg Heitmann, Stephanie schulte strathaus for this opportunity, as well as Marilyn David for the excellent support and organization. And she will... Um, be our microphone passing person today. And she was at the bar before. Um, and also Bennett, Jonas and Jonas for this technical setup. Thank you so much uh, for making this possible. The series critically returns to the local context of Derek Jarman's work and his film, The Garden. This very humble series, it's just three events. So we can't do everything, but we attempt to go um, to critically look at the context of Derek Jarman's work and his film, The Garden, in order to mine their relevance for a contemporary global situation. The discussions take us from AIDS to COVID, from a threatening nuclear power plant hovering over queer performances taking place in and around a beautiful, sparse garden, to the environmental catastrophe that is a dangerous horizon of our present. And from the collectivity around AIDS, AIDS activism, to the collaboration and collectivity in art and activism today. We kicked off the series with Heather Davis's great talk on plastic and queer kinship, and I'm extremely happy to have a bunch of wonderful people with me today to consider gardening, collectivity, and activism. And we'll begin the evening with a screening of two works by Rahana Saman. And I will introduce Rahana in just a second, but I'd like to welcome all of our guests today. Um, Rahana Saman here, um, Bashkar Sarkar, Bishnu Priya Ghosh, and Ed Webb Ingle. Welcome to you all. You can clap. Okay. <laughs> They're clapping. I don't know if you can hear that, <laughs> but they, they are clapping. Um, okay, and um, the way that I organized it today is I thought we would start with um, these two films by Rahana, and um, after that there will be a uh, discussion. I'll have a Q&A with Rahana, and you're welcome to join in the discussion. And then we will move into presentations, short presentations, 10 to 12, 15 minute by um, Bashkar Sarkar, Bishnu Priya Ghosh. And then we'll finish with a slightly longer presentation um, by Ed Webb Ingo, who brought us some surprise um, footage that he's uncovered in his research into um, uh, AIDS activists video in the UK. Rahana Saman is an artist from Hekmanwijk. <laughs> I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> okay. Um, but she's based in London, and her work speaks to the entanglement of personal experience and social life, where moments of intimacy are framed against cultural orthodoxies and state coercion. Conversation and cooperative methods sit at the heart of her practice. Her work moves between the art and the film world, and will be featured in forthcoming exhibitions this year, including an exhibition in Toronto at Trinity Square Video, at the Boras International Sculpture Biennial in Sweden, the Artist Film International in Whitechapel in London, among others. In 2019, she co-edited the artist publication Tongues and was shortlisted for the Film London Jarman Award. She's currently a board member of Not Nowhere Artist Workers Cooperative and Lux Moving Image, 
who also distribute her films. And I thank Matt Carter and the people at Lux uh, for making her work available to us today. I was interested in showing Rahana's work in this context, in part, I have to admit, because she was a nominee for the Jarman Award. That intrigued me. What is, it, what is this Jarman Award? I think that's something we can discuss maybe afterwards. But also because I think her interest in gardening and collaboration can provide a useful starting point for considering Jarman and the garden from a multiple of perspectives today. And on top of it, she herself is a gardener. Uh, so I think she can add her own expertise about gardening to our discussion. Um, yeah, welcome, Rahana. Would you like to say a few words about um, the films today? Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you for inviting me for being part of this amazing panel with really smart, amazing people. Um, I'm really excited to get into a conversation with everyone. Um, just a quick thing, really, about the two films. Um, it's quite strange for me to see these two films together um, because there's quite a, a long period between them. So I think the first film you're going to see is I, 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 I and I, which was made in 2013. And it's quite, it's quite an early film um, in, in sort of my work, really, uh, and came out of uh, a commission by Studio Voltaire working with a curator called Louise Shelley um, and Joe Scotland, who were basically working with the archive of um, the photographer, feminist photographer Joe Spence, um, and curating a show around her work around illness and her collaborative methods working within uh, the community and community photography and collective working. So the, the commission for that film really arose um, out of spending time with Joe Spencer's archive and thinking about these questions of um, what working together as a group might be and what the consequences on the individual is within that and trying to take those questions to um, a group of people to see what might emerge. Um, so a lot of the methods uh, that have gone into that film have come from come from uh, a conversation with this archive. Um, so the film is a 20-minute yeah, film and um, working with a group of young people from Body and Soul Charity in London um, who yeah, have, now, have now moved on from the charity, but um, which is a charity supporting people affected by HIV and AIDS. Um, and then... Moving forward to the other film that you'll see today, uh, Your Ecstatic Self, which was a film that I actually made in 2019, which just before the pandemic hit, actually, um, it, was, it was sort of finished. January 2020, it started to circulate. Um, and it's a film that uses a slightly, it's, it's much closer, it's much more personal in a way. Um, and I won't say too much about it, but um, I guess there's a, a slightly different method of production that's behind it. Um, so yeah, for me, it's quite interesting to see those films together in a program, and I'm really looking forward to chatting with you in, in a bit, Mark, about it. Yeah. Thank you, Rahana. Um, and thank you for allowing me to crudely put the two of them together <laughs> in this way. We'll, s we'll see how that works, and I look forward to discussing it. And, and I also just wanted to tell all of you here live, unfortunately, I can't help the people who are not here, but um, the bar is still open throughout the evening. And I'll do my best uh, to do double duty and um, serve you drinks if you like. Um, great. So enjoy the screening, and we'll be back to discuss after the two films. Rahana, are you there? Yes. <laughs> Welcome back, Rahana. <laughs> Rahana. <laughs> we're clapping. I don't know if you were able to catch that i did Thank okay you. okay good <laughs> yeah rahana um maybe i'll just um <coughs> excuse me i'll just start first by apologizing um because between the two films we didn't see the end credits on um i i i and i and it it then i i thought it 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 created a kind of interesting connection, if you will, between the two films, because then when the second film begins and we are hearing your brother um, speaking, it, it was 
even though I know the films, it still felt like, are we, are we hearing, is he speaking about himself? Is, or is he, are we continuing in this vein of characters um, seeming to share a story and, and a kind of collective storytelling um, for for me, it was very it was an interesting connection um, between the two films. Was this question of storytelling and attention and and your careful attention to the spoken word? Um, that that may sound right now too abstract. I don't know, but I know in a lot of your work, you're very interested in in he letting people speak and and hearing what they have to say. But but maybe could you could you say something about if we if we let your ecstatic self sit with ourselves for a second, but to go back to I I I and I, can you say something about um, the origin of this speaking, the origin of this text, um, how that yeah where where that came about? Yeah, it was funny. Um, I really had the same oh feeling. Sorry, I'm doing this weird thing where I'm watching you. On, an, on the YouTube channel, but it, there's a lag, so it looks like you're still talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I know it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated technical setup for everyone. Um, so I'll just try and ignore you a little bit. Yeah, ignore but, me, ignore me. Ignore the movement, but um, yeah, it's really funny because I had a really similar feeling actually watching them together and that sort of the scene, the scene running through the two films around... Um, forms of storytelling and what is being said and what is being inferred through what is being said, the kind of the subtext of a story or what, what might be read between a story that, that kind of belies something else or can become quite cryptic or circular um, and or performative mm -hmm. in the case of Sajid sometimes um, or, and certainly in the other film, but um, in I, 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 I. So the, the script actually from I, 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 I and I um, was entirely constructed through um, material generated through these workshops that we were having. So we, there was a year-long process of uh, workshops that took place on site at Body and Soul, and there was a youth youth club uh, at the charity that I first volunteered at for a few months, and then began to work with a, a Thursday night group and and held these like periodic um, longer sort of sessions of a week or, or um, several days, um, and then followed up with uh, evening sessions. And in those workshops, we would try, we would play different improvisation games. We would uh, do workshops such as relaxation workshops around the body, somatic exercises to um, build trust. And, and so what you see in that first section of the, the walking around the room and changing your body shape but that is that comes from the workshops that we were doing and that we would use each time some of the stories uh, and the games that were told were generated through the workshops and so um as much as possible there was a desire to try and um channel what had been spoken by members of the group into a form that the film could hold so that we would there was the difficulty of the of the the project was we were dealing with the fact that none of the young people were to appear directly in the films and to be mm. recognizable um, because of their vulnerability um and you know this was sort of under child protection and safeguarding um so we were trying we were immediately dealt dealing with this idea of mediation mm -hmm. and translation that was kind of the the, the first and foremost um process through which we were thinking about how we might construct a film together. Um, and each, so each meeting that we would have was kind of responsive. Actually, there, there wasn't a, we knew we were making a film, but there was no predetermined outcome as to what that film might be that we might mm. develop a script towards. So the kind of um, fragmentary nature of the film is, is also reflective of the way in which we as a group were communicating our experiences and um, and feelings in those spaces, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, so there's certain details that that give you a sense as to who the people in the group might be, the names that are used, the the details around the grandparent and the um, the background uh, to where people live, and 
and also it's very much coming from the imagination of a young person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we mm-hmm. have, yeah, um, we have intrigue and a thriller, and you know the, the level of drama is quite heightened. Um, so, so yeah, so the script, as much as possible, was trying to play with these different registers of speech that were. Um, appearing through these different conversations and forms of conversations that we were mm-hmm. having and trying to be true to that, to honor that and see where that would take us. I see. And then, and, and they're actors who are performing these texts, correct? Or yeah. 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 So we cast, we cast the three actors. Um, and so part of the work, part of the script was um, direct transcripts of stories that might be shared. Mm-hmm. And then, Part of the script is a story that we were constructing together through these improvisation games around this uh, motif of the pig. This the pig came up in a in a sort of a comedy improvisation word association game, and so we tried to building building on theatre improv games from Brecht, from um, uh, Augusto Boal and Forum Theatre. Um, you know, really trying to pull from. Uh, theatrical traditions that were politically invested, you know, that were, but that were also about, to some extent, how to speak to political and social concerns and, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, affect change through those modes. Um, We were, we were experimenting with that in the sessions. And so the story runs parallel to the story of our interaction in the workshops. Mm -hmm. And it becomes very confused. Yeah, no, that that's something because I, I felt like the the performance of the actors seems to um, they definitely there's definitely a distancing between them and the speech so that that the the story seems not to belong to any one of them, but but we both get the performers and w- then we get this kind of strange story that's being continually expanded upon, reflected upon by the different people. So that's why it interested me what the the relationship was between the the people speaking and then what was spoken yeah yeah for sure i think i think there was also this desire to to play with that gap Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to not try and collapse that gap through a, a smooth um i think that you know Increasingly, it, and it's something I've I've been thinking about a lot is consumption, the consumption of the audience, and the mm-hmm. desire to, particularly around um, around story storytelling or um, the sharing of personal experiences or the sharing of a pain or loss or mourning, you know, and how how that is presented to an audience, um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so I think it, at that time. Um, Actually, we didn't speak directly to the, the reason why we were forming as a group. Um, it never really, the, the, the very nature of why, of, of what the young people were at Body and Soul for, were, were there for, never actually came, ne- was never spoken to directly in the workshops. It, mm. it was always as an escape. It was always as an escape to go somewhere else. And so that's, that's how the material, um, we, we kind of trusted the material then just to take us where it, where it would. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I think for me that film is also kind of a turning, the beginnings of something about really trying to interrogate um, what constitutes collective filmmaking actually, and and I think subsequently I you know I look at that film and I think there's so many things that came out of that that um, I have really tried to deepen and interrogate as a way of working, with, and and similarly in terms of maybe working with my members of my family, but also trying to think about when you're, if, if filmmaking is, is a sort of a form of research on knowledge making, like where am I positioned and where am I positioned in, what is the context, what is the specificity of my position in relation to the people that I'm in relation with? Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, in that film, I think it was, um, I think it was, there was a, so much going on under the surface that also we were having to manage, uh, we were mediated, the group was mediated through the charity and, you know, that in a way that also affects the possibilities of speech and what can be spoken and what kind of relation can happen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but maybe we can. Yeah. 
Yeah, if um, well, actually, I wanted to to move then maybe to your ecstatic self because there there seems um, well, in some sense, with the speech, there seems very little mediation. It's a it's a a direct. It seems like a direct discussion between you and your brother in the car, if I if I follow that correctly, and then you and your sister in the garden. I mean, there's mediation maybe in the aesthetic of the film in the the inserts, this um, incredible footage from www.hunzo.com. Um, that, that seems to mediate between, let's say, the garden images and and the discussion with your brother. But maybe, um, maybe could we start with the, come to the garden, like, um, I'm not a gardener. I didn't know what these red berries are um, and I, but but there there seemed to be some kind of ritual that that was being prepared for with the gardening. And I'd just be interested of your why, just simply naive. Why why bring together this discussion with your brother and uh, you gardening? Um, so firstly, the so yeah, the conversation is with is with my brother and. It's kind of never really stated, but we, I guess it, it's the, the degree of intimacy that is taking place in the car suggests a, a personal relationship. But the, the person in the, um, the green space um, is not my sister, oh, um, she's, but she, maybe she's chosen family rather than, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, biographic uh, bloodline. Mm -hmm. um, but she's, but I think there was this, so, um, I mean, there's many reasons why practically it sort of ended up happening that way. Originally, mm -hmm. I was actually meant to go to Pakistan to, to film, actually, and um, there were issues with, like, the visa. So, originally, the, the outdoor space and the kind of the, the landscape, the presence of um, this sort of semi-public space was going to be elsewhere, but that... that Green space is also left ambiguous um, and is actually an allotment that I've, I had, um, I've had for a few years. Um, and so gardening and doing, engaging in like growing things and, and care, care in, in, a, in, a, in a sort of, um, in an environment that isn't an urban environment is something that I've increasingly been drawn to on a personal mm -hmm. level and because I love it. Um, but then increasingly was also thinking about what the specificity of, of the allotment space is actually as this liminal space, as this space that is between, like an edge land space between, um, that particular allotment is sort of sandwiched between these industrial estates and, um, and yeah, and, and green spaces that are kind of might rise up between a fenced area of a railway and it's actually really beautiful. I rewatched in um, the garden. I hadn't seen it for ten years, and it was just really wonderful to to sort of read this film in relation to that. Even though it's so different, but mm -hmm. um, thinking about where Derek Jarman's garden is located in relation to the the power station and this proximity of of nurturing, this act of nurturing and trying to cultivate life um, under the shadow of something so toxic and overbearing, you know, like, you know, this sort of gesture of um, industrial machismo. Mm -hmm. um, and in a similar way, I kind of perceive the allotment as being this incredibly potent, I guess, like a portal into these other spaces and these other cosmologies and these other ways of knowing and being in the world. And so for me, this, this dialogue that's happening in the car that's so structured actually and direct uh, in this very sort of tight interior space. Um, I was kind of interested in where I could escape that through these other spaces mm -hmm. and, and then where else that might take me in terms of these archival material moments where then it, it's kind of collapsing these spatial temporal logics um, that are kind of, we carry in our bodies as we, like I, I was feeling at the time, particularly, and in this conversation with my brother around genealogy and around um, these, yeah, I guess the legacies of of how like sexuality and uh, gender and um, race are kind of so um, imbued with colonial violence, really. 
um, mm. and to try and kind of really stretch that, you know, make that elastic and fold it in and not try and create this, I don't know. Um, I, I think I was also thinking very clearly in the car, that conversation came out of a lot of um, uh, wanting to kind of speak to the way in which particularly uh, Asian men in the UK, Pakistani Asian men uh, and women actually, but um, specifically there's a, a, a very um, kind of gruesome way in which Pakistani Asian men are sexualized as sexual predators and, um, you know, in relation to groom, child grooming and sexual exploitation. And so there's, um, particularly where I'm from, actually, in the North. Um, so there was a kind of a, how, how can this conversation around um, an experience of love and desire um, and sex um, be placed alongside questions of Islam and religion uh, in a way that doesn't become fractured, um, but can also move between these binaries of Hindu philosophy and Islamic philosophy in a way that there is a there is actually a scene between Tantra and Sufism and the you know that these things can be mutable or can speak to one another differently. Um, and so yeah, also although there's a gender binary appearing, there's also uh, women appearing in a landscape and mm -hmm. working the land in a way that we also don't see um you know that that there's a an engagement with um a practice of cultivation that can yeah, be yeah. women and non-binary um so yeah these were the the kind of placements and a desire to see what might happen when those things are placed adjacent great yeah i i that I, I really appreciate your elaborations. I mean, I, for me, a lot of that came through um, mm -hmm. in in the aesthetic, but that helped um, that helped provide some background for me. Um, I, I I think um, I, I would love to discuss more about the film, but I, I really would um, and um, give the audience the opportunity to ask questions. But I think it may be good if we move on right now, if that's okay. Rahana and Rahana is still with us, so we'll be able to discuss then everything together um, at the end of this uh, marathon evening. Um, don't forget to come up and get some refreshments. But um, thank you, Rahana, um, for for the discussion, and um, I look forward to continuing this. And now I'd like to, um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to to oh. People can clap. Was there some clapping? <laughs> um, great. And um, I'd like to move on now um, with a contribution by Bashkar Sarkar, um, who's here beneath you, actually, um, in the space. Um, and Bashkar um, professionally is a professor um, for film and media studies at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And he's um, been working for some time on a project on plastics, what he calls Cosmoplastics, a book project with the subtitle Bollywood's Global Gesture. And I'm also working on a book on queer underground club cultures in millennial Los Angeles. And I should say that, um, that, that none of these professional uh, qualifications are the reason why I invited Bashkar <laughs> Sarkar or Bishnu Priya Ghosh, who will speak afterwards, but because actually we, we both sort of, or we three of us sort of came of age um, in Los Angeles in the queer club scene together at a time where we were um, watching Derek Jarman films as they were coming out. And we've all moved on to different um, areas of interest in our own scholarly life, but I just thought it would be wonderful um, collectively to um, reflect back on, um, on Jarman through the lens of our present interests. And, um, and that's why I was, I'm super happy that um, Bashkar Sarkar could join us. Um, so please uh, welcome Bashkar Sarkar. Thanks, Mark. So, you know, this call put me down a rabbit hole of the early 90s, really. So when Mark invited me to this panel, I was a bit hesitant at far first. Although Jarman remains one of my favorite media artists, I had always savored his work in more personal, more effective ways, and I did not particularly want to subject 
his epiphanic montages, his libidinal gestures, and his hallucinatory becomings to any form of detached analysis. For my generation, German signifies queer excess and resistance, but German also names an unresolved sense of loss, a generational melancholia. It is difficult to master a critical position with respect to him. So having revisited the garden from 1990 after a long interval, I was struck by two points, and that's what I'll dwell on today. The first has to do with the reaction that a lot of people have when they watch this film, that it is too self-indulgent. I want to explore if this quality, usually taken to be a problem, can be recast in more affirmative terms. The second point is about Jarman's relationship to not just the garden around his cottage is Dungeness Ken, where he spent his final years, but more crucially, to the act of gardening. The broader question I want to pose here is this. What are the resonances between German's filmmaking and German's gardening? Might self-indulgence provide a link between the two realms of activity? So in his daily extensive diaries, diary entries from 1989 and 1990, which were later published as the volume Modern Nature, German writes responding to somebody's question as to why he always appeared so happy. Because I am the most fortunate uh, filmmaker of my generation. I have only ever done what I wanted. Now I just film my life and I am a happy megalomaniac. So a first sense of self-indulgence often associated with avant-garde filmmakers. They're invested only in realizing their singular vision without consideration for the demands of genre, audience, or financial backers. Just a few days later, on August 31, the tone has darkened and German expresses self-doubt. However hard I try, now I find it almost impossible to connect with others, let alone myself. Was it ever any different? Was I gifted or was it as burden of proof that I took to film? Are others happier, more content? I rarely feel moments of self-pity, but when they come, they roll over me. So a second iteration of self-indulgence then, <laughs> self-doubt often devolving into self-pity. By mid-1989, German is beginning to experience all kinds of symptoms, allergies and ski itchy skin, night sweats and fever, acute muscle cramps and weakening vision, all signs of the virus gradually colonizing his body. News arrives from London or New York, it seems every other day of friends and collaborators losing their battles with the disease. Meanwhile, German's previous film, War Requiem, is being panned by critics and audiences alike. He has just begun work on his next script, which is to be shot without a script. Uh, sorry, on his next project, which is to be shot without a script. It'll feature his garden at Prospect Cottage in a big way, and Jarman will appear as himself. So from the diary entry of June 24, I cannot watch anything that is not based on its author's life. Acting, camera work, all the paraphernalia bring me little pleasure without the element of autobiography. And from August 16, the garden is a simple domestic drama, a document, no fiction, the smallest gesture. Here we encounter another twist on cinematic self-indulgence, intimacy, drift, and play as the conditions for a creative innovation. An unscripted nonfiction film, intensely personal, mainly autobiographical even, the whole emerging from fevered improvisation, adjustment and editing, the process itself documenting the self's becoming. There are two aspects to this process. It's non-linearity and it's forging of a subject. Early in the film, the voiceover invites us to follow the filmmaker along a different kind of narrative pathway. A standalone half sentence from December 2 
penned in the throes of shooting, the filming, not the film. And just a few days later, David asked me how I thought of all this. The truth is I didn't. You start with one thing and you end with another. So what kind of subject emerges from this cinema of indirection of perpetual reinscription? If the garden is autobiographical, then the autos of this biography is radically immanent. The film captures the simultaneous becoming unraveling of a German-like subject in the folds of social institution spaces and practices, the church, the monarchy, the school, the bathhouse, the institution of marriage, grace, gay subcultures, paparazzi and celebrity cultures, the otherworldly light on the craggy and windset shores of Dungeness, the garden in the shadow of the nuclear power plant. And this subject is at once and inseparably individual and collective. The project involves several of the filmmaker's regular collaborators, his creative family, most notably composer Simon Fisher Turner and German's friend and muse, Tilda Swinton, as well as Kevin Collins, German's own partner for the last several years of his life as one of the lead characters. It is a product as much of German's own impending mortality as it is a document of the precarity felt by an entire community ravaged by the AIDS epidemic in the pre-cocktail years. In its lack of a clear structure, its elusive drift, the film enacts a deep sense of melancholia. German would later note that in the garden, all the art failed because AIDS was too vast a subject to film. Failed or not, in retrospect, the film appears to mobilize a remarkably complex semiosis of mourning. Mourning a wasted generation, ignored and abandoned purportedly because it refuses to fit into normative social structures. One might argue that the film's ambitions run deeper, that it places greenhouse effects along the, alongside the epidemic to take on environmental depredation in a resonant, if, if oblique, manner. The garden, the film, cannot be separated from the garden at Prospect Cottage or from German's gardening activities. Planting, arranging, tending, watering, pruning, activities that add up to a regimen of active and sustained care seem to have provided the ailing filmmaker with a therapeutic vocation, one that offered respite from the frenetic life as a fetid cultural figure and that helped him become more attuned to the demands of his diseased body. The diary entries in modern nature are full of joy about the red poppies, of despair. It's a strange feeling to put in the roses and wonder if you'll see them bloom, and of optimism, wondering if the rose outside the kitchen window, now flowering for the first time, will see the nuclear power station out. For Jarman, his body, his garden, and his surrounds all come together in mutuality and empathy. Caring for the garden becomes a matter of self-care. Oddly, German chose a harsh seaside spot close to a nuclear power plant for his final and most significant garden, as if to see if his plants, like his people, people of his kind, could thrive even under inhospitable conditions. But he goes further, developing his garden in marked distinction from the well-tended English heritage gardens. You see, it is a rather wild garden. I really recommend this. Out with the lawns and in with the stinging nettles and curbside flowers. So this contrary garden is then decorated with local shingles and flint and junk sculpture made out of discarded anchors, corkscrews, parts of metal equipment, and driftwood. The stress is on a certain scruffy nature it is not the nature of Constable and Palmer paintings, but a modern nature. German invokes his father's strictly utilitarian approach to gardening. He attacks any wayward shrub that hindered the clean straight lines of his mowed lawn or any tree that dared to grow too luxuriant. 
and he connects it to the latter's love of discipline and consistency in life. His dad would eat an apple pie every dinner, every evening, 365 days of the year. In contrast, Jarman's gardening, like most of other aspects of his life, is built on the unexpected, the errant, and the queer. It is not practical, but excessive and indulgent. One would expect nothing short of this iconoclastic figure who was canonized by the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, a group known for their agitprop use of drag and Christian iconicity to challenge sexual discrimination and moral policy. I'm reminded here of Bataille's discussion of the restrictive economy and excess that often turns to waste. Order and decorum wrought at the cost of wasted lives, wasted potentialities but excess returns as expression of vitality, as wily subversion, as spirited resistance. The garden is rather self-indulgent. The etymological root of indulgence, play, to engage oneself, to be or become fixated, connects it to affection, tenderness, complacence, addiction, yielding, and play. This semantic chain points to the possibility of deep engagement and caring while being exploratory and playful at the same time. As I have suggested for German, self-indulgence and self-care are intimately linked to the care of his indulgent and excessive community. On February 25, 1989, he writes, a personal mythology recurs in my writing much the same way poppy reeds have crept into my films. For me, this archeology span has become obsessive. All received information should make us invert sad. But before I finish, I intend to celebrate our corner of paradise, the part of the garden the Lord forgot to mention. So here, Jarman suggests direct connections between his filmmaking and his gardening. Both activities are driven by an impulse to archive, collect, to document and preserve his memories for posterity, to collect and store away the seeds from his plants for the next season. But simple preservation is not enough. To celebrate our corner of the paradise, the memories, like the seeds, must be revivified, nurtured, and proliferated. The queer life garden must be fully lived out without fear of decay, death, or expiation. This is why the domestic drama of the garden feels so epic, its small gestures so grandiose, so blasphemous, even so revolutionary. On September 13, 1989, as he was beginning to have trouble with his eyesight, and as he was starting to shoot the garden, German wrote the following in his diary, articulating the key function of the film. As I sweat it out in the early hours, a guilty victim of the scourge, I want to bear witness how happy I am and will be until the day I die, that I was part of the hated sexual revolution and that I don't regret a simple step or encounter that I made in that time. Thanks. Thank you, Bashkar. That was wonderful. Um, and I think we're um, attending to a little technical problem with PowerPoint um, that we should clear up for the next presentation. Um, yeah, Bishnu Priya Ghosh is um, not simply a um, club goer, um, a classic club goer, but she's also a professor of English and global studies at the University, University of California in Santa Barbara. And she's um, completing a book right now, uh, which is, I think, of acute relevance today. It's called The Virus Touch, Theorizing Ep Epidemic Media. And it con considers how mediatic pra processes detect and compose epidemics as crisis events. And she's going to be discussing gardening 
today, but I think we do we have okay, we're we're up with the PowerPoint. So please welcome yeah, Bishnu Priya Ghosh. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Mark, uh, for this invitation, again, for sending us back uh, to the 90s. <laughs> um, and um, I wanted to actually, what was pleasurable for me uh, was to think about how much of an open futurity there was in Jarman's work. So what I'm really going to talk about is um, the garden as an emergent milieu and gardening as a kind of environmental practice and theory. So. Yes, I'm going to start this. Let's see. There'll be just images running. Okay. Is that working? Yeah. yeah. So the wild gardens of the Anthropocene. When Hiroshima was destroyed by an atom bomb in 1945, writes Anna Singh, it is said that the first thing to emerge from the blasted landscape was the Matsutake mushroom. Following the resilient, abundant mushroom, Singh goes on to explore new assemblies of industrial waste, human foragers, of uh, uh, fungi among human disturbed forests. And so this invocation of precarious life in a precarious environment launches an exploration that I think was also Jarman's uh, exploration, how to survive in the blasted ruins of the Anthropocene. And by now, of course, this is very familiar to us, multi-species entanglements, um, uh, environmental disrepair, but it was not so common at the time that he planted these famous gardens around Prospect uh, Cottage at Dungeness in the 90s. He was keenly attuned to precarious life. His wild gardens configured a distributed subject in its encounter with invisible forces. And of course, there are, there's a garden, the physical one that he documents in his uh, Derek Jarman's garden and his diary, Modern Nature, and its audiovisual counterpart in the 1990 film. And in both cases, deadly pathogens, deadly toxins, emissions burning through cellular life are protagonists. One is already here in his body, the other potentially there, over at the nuclear plant. Uh, these are unseen protagonists, and they can be intuited. A visual matter, they pose a problem of representation. We perceive them mostly in the vital degeneration of humans, plants, and animals. So their presence pervades the environs around Prospect Cottage, from which we can see the glowing Dungeness nuclear power point. So here is, I'm uh, linking between Rohana and Bhaskar's garden, to um, uh, the radioactivity that is um, coming in uh, uh, Ed's talk. So against devastation and loss, the submicroscopic particles flourish, abundant and unstoppable. The milieu teems with lively presences, indexically caught on camera. In fluctuations of light, the close-ups of objects in motion, and you can see this in some of the footage that I've cut from the film, the varying camera speeds. These cinematic techniques self-consciously underscore the fabrication of the milieu. The garden is not natural. It emerges in natural and technical processes that interpenetrate each other. Towards the close of the film, natural elements, water, fire, wind, are in frenzy, wildly gesturing at the quiet camera. By now, we are quite certain that the torn earth and scorched sky, as German records, no longer offer protection. Living in this place, his wild garden that refuses fences, eschews the calm of the lawn, cluttered with stones and industrial remains, it is both overgrown and sparse, but always changeful. Not his father's garden, as Pashkur mentioned, the one that is tamed by the axe, it honors his mother's protest of the assault on nature. Now the question is, what do we make of this wild garden in post-Anthropocene thought? Folded in HIV AIDS collectivities, does Jarman's physical and filmic garden theorize practice what Singh characterized as the living space of entanglements? Is there an incipient politics of entanglement? Even as the gardener makes iterative appearance in film and writing, the garden always exceeds the centered subject. Other becomings are in progress. Faced with imminent death, 
what does the garden activate? And here you see some of the garden, it figures, its overgrowth figures abundance, spilling, leaking, spreading across the landscape. A litany of plants, flowers, herbs, weed proliferate, some native to the landscape, some cultivated from Jarman's exploration of local nurseries. As with the Matsutake forests, we hear that mine craters from World War II at Dungeness are rich in plant life. Industrial waste yields strange delights in new assemblies. More than once, he escapes from the garden. Because it has no fence or boundaries, he asks, where does it end? This topography of a limitless expanse brings some recompense. The dead will become matter living on in this brutal seething landscape. Hence, Jarman is especially delighted at plants that leap about, crossing the road. The thrift is out, he writes, a wonderful wild plant that carpets the landscape on the other side of the nuclear station. The overgrowth materializes the wild garden as an extensive planetary living space. I would like anyone who reads my book, says Jarman, to try this wildness in a corner. It will bring you much happiness. Abundance here is technique, a blueprint for living. But in the epidemic episteme, abundance is threat, actual and virtual, extinguishing multicellular life forms. In the pre-retroviral times, of which many of us hung, in which many of us hung out together, when life was exigent, there was little option but to live with flourishing pathogenic life, to make very difficult kin with awkward creatures, as Eva Giraud names them, which are not charismatic forms of life. And this always complicates the multi-species politics. Overcome by abundance by biological and chemical uh, particles imperceptible to the naked eye, multicellular life is on the retreat. As a condition against the demos, epidemia forces a reckoning with extreme abundance and extreme loss. There is no middle ground, and we see it now at our current juncture. Against the rugged landscape among bloom and decay, Jarman uh, erects spectral stones the guardians of loss, he proliferates them among natural forms. Approached from imminent death in this primordial time of mourning, abundance disperses human matter into dust, into the ashes that close the film. This other abundance, the silent spring at Dungeness. The challenge, of course, is to uh, perceive a visual materialities that are breeding, breaching body boundaries, are silent killers, of the Anthropocene. We know, of course, now, uh, after um, the infamous conference of 1989, which talked about emerging infectious disease events, that these are ecological events. 60% of our deadly viruses are zoonotic, skipping species barriers. 71% of them are from wildlife. So everything from habitat de destruction to industrial farming has created new conditions for viral emergence. Like industrial toxins and radioactive drift, human activity activates zoonotic viruses. Abundant matter, they spread like wildflower, uh, not wildflower, wildfire, our inheritance of planetary damage. But how to render these presences in this garden that sprawls into a greater milieu? How to activate the sensorium, alerting us to their movements? Here, Jarman turns to audiovisual conjurations, disorienting flashing lights, time lights photography, of course, on screen sounds of wind and water, all compose a restless milieu, dynamic and fluctuating in its force. Mediatic gestures speculate viruses, toxins, emissions irradiating in this milieu. We sense movements in the mediums that transport them. And what you're seeing in the images, of course, are these elemental mediums. Elemental mediums sustain the distribution of invisible em emissions, quiet, deadly. So it's the wind, it's the fire, it's the water. Vital mediums transmit viruses, so something like blood or, or mucus. Since viruses don't have any locomotion without bodily fluids, they would not move. Sometimes elemental and vital mediums interface. And if you think of our current circumstance, of course, we are, we are sensing the air between us all the time in the drift of SARS-CoV-2, but the air also enters our lungs, an interior milieu. 
So nuclear leaks, virus particles drift, as Peter Van Wyck once noted, they're hostile to containment. The medium is the milieu, whispering, moving, blurring, sharpening. Elemental mediums rush at us in the film, fire, water, soil, air. The wind is constant. It rattles the bones in the graves, writes Jarman, sending rats shivering down sewers. The waves crash incessantly against gravelly shores. Blood and water at many junctures exit bodies, eminently transitive. Submicroscopic particles are borne across bodies in this lively, bristling world. Herbs, weeds, fowl, stones, abandoned trash, rabbits and slugs accompany human figures thrown together in irreducible entanglement. This is queer animacy, as Mel Chen describes it, an open spatiality of the body, a wilding of subjectivity. Among these new assemblies, Jarman Ford's The Metabolic Rift of Industrial Times. He ingests the garden. Here, the plant is the botanical mediator between human species and the natural industrial landscape. He often referred to the garden as his pharmacopoeia, brimming with natural remedies. Against the failure of modern science, these ancient secrets were abuzz with potentials. In his writings, Jarman speaks evocatively of rosemary or sea dew as hardy, recalling young men in Greece who wore garlands to stimulate the mind. Where rosemary grew, he writes in Modern Nature, women rule. We hear of friends falling ill, of offering aconite, belladonna, santolina. We hear sleepy, uh, sleeping with a sprig of lavender under one's pillow enables one to see ghosts, to travel to the land of the dead. Many of my own generation will remember how friends in the pre-cocktail era turned to natural remedies, to astragalus root, to milk thistle, to ward off bodily degeneration from HIV infection. As mediators, plants ensure continuities between molar forms and the larger biosphere. The gardener is an herbalist, tenderly remaking the milieu in a time of emergency. As the wild garden spreads out, as it moves in, the work of repair begins for the body, for friends, for community, for elements, for the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Bishnu. That was lovely. Um, yeah, we um, I will we'll continue. There's, there's so much one could say about these two discussions, but I think it would be nice to bring um, Ed Webb Ingle into the conversation. Um, Ed um, is someone who co-edited the Derek Jarman sketchbooks, and he's also um, active as a filmmaker, a researcher, and a lecturer right now on, on the BA Film and Screen Studies course at London College of Communication, University of the Arts. He is currently working on a project looking into the role of video in response to housing struggles, as well as on a book called The Story of Video Activism. And um, he, I was really thrilled that Ed agreed to come today um, to discuss his research into AIDS activist video activism in the UK and present us with some of um, his findings. So please join me in welcoming Ed Webb Ingle. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. I'm just checking that. I'm going to wait for the slide to be behind you, Mark, and then I think... Is it behind you now? Yeah, it's behind me. Okay, great, cool. Yeah. Like, there's, there's a delay, so I've got, like, it's like Minority Report. I've got loads of windows open trying to follow everything. But, yeah, thanks so much. This has been uh, wonderful to be part of this, and um, seeing that footage in the last presentation was just so beautiful to be reminded of, of what it looks like down there. Um, I spent a lot of time at Prospect Cottage inside and outside doing research for the the book and going to the sketchbook so it's great to be taken back there um yeah so this invitation to speak at this event was um, a chance for me to, like mark said to look at some of my current research into aids activist video in the uk and then make some connections to my previous work on derek jarman um let me see if this works yes okay um in his journal come polemic at your own risk jarman reflects on his receiving the results of his aids test on the 22nd of december 1987. The young doctor who told me this morning I was a carrier of the AIDS virus was visibly distressed. I smiled and told her not to worry. I'd never like Christmas. 
I put on my dark black overcoat I love so much to walk to the hospital. Wearing it at my father's funeral a few weeks ago, I looked more somber than the undertakers. It gave me confidence for this meeting. 20 years prior to this, Jarman spent some time attending meetings of the Gay Liberation Front. He found their approach, and these are his words, dour, censorious, and joyless. And his attention soon became focused on his burgeoning career, designing sets for Ken Russell's The Devils, and shooting super eight films of his friends, whilst chasing the boys he was cruising at the meetings. Following his diagnosis, Jarman's enga engagement with what would become queer activism took on a new urgency through his involvement with Outrage. Um, who formed in 1990 as part of a broad-based group of queers committed to radical, non-violent direct action and civil disobedience. Jarman was drawn to their emphasis on queer activism rather than the gay politics he'd previously experienced. For Jarman, queer more fully encompassed his own experiences and outrages anti-assimilationist, um, angry and creative actions soon meant he became a regular fixture at meetings held in the basement of the London Lesbian and Gay Centre and he attended many actions. Um, this, is, uh, this, this talk is going to go a bit all over the place, and this map will hopefully keep us in, in one very loose temporal space. Um, so Jarman wasn't the only theatre designer who became a filmmaker attending these meetings. In 1990, Mark Harriet, who was working for free as a theatre designer at the Young Vic, co-founded a queer video magazine called Pout with his friends. A group of, in his words, poor lesbians and gays who wanted to see their lives and stories represented. They were inspired by the cut and paste DOI approach of another lesbian and gay video project called Framed Youth, Revenge of the Teenage Perverts, which was broadcast late at night um, in 1987 on Channel 4. Apart from this and Out on a Tuesday, a, week, a weekly lesbian and gay magazine program on Channel 4 from 1989, lesbian and gay representation was scarce and rarely originated from within the lesbian and gay community. Alongside the HIV and AIDS epidemic, the video camcorder became available. This new technology allowed for accessibility and new forms of representation. It was easy to use and encouraged the democratization of video production. Prior to this, video recording technology was either um, low quality or else large and expensive, and quite often both. Access to these new video cameras enabled groups and individuals to create a counter narrative and alternative to broadcast media. So in 1991, through a carefully written application to Camden Council, which managed to slip through the watchful censorship of section 28, Pout received funding to purchase their own video camera, and they started shooting and compiling a mixture of video art performances, magazine features, and outrage actions. To give a sense of what they were making, here is a list of contents from the back of Pout issue one. Homo horoscopes, wish you were queer, a travel special. Food, sex, what is sexy, interviews with people on the streets. Is more than a mouthful of waste? Do lesbians cottage, sexy stories, stars in their eyes, Cooking with Confidence, Lesbo Fantasies, Classified Lonely Hearts. These features were intercut with, out with footage of outraged demonstrations and actions. Mark explained in a recent interview that by showing this footage between more lighthearted or sexy clips, politics and the work of outrage would be seen as something that could be fun and accessible. So I met up with Mark in 2019 when I was trying to trace the history of AIDS activist video in the UK. And when I started researching this area of activist video, I envisaged footage of mass protests and kissings by lesbian and gay groups in public spaces. The action I had in mind was comprised of handheld, shaky lo-fi camera work, recorded from the perspective of the activist. The grainy color image pulled and pushed around with the camera person. As I envisaged it, this would be cut together with interviews with small groups of people in domestic spaces, meeting halls and, and on street corners, reflecting on their personal experiences with doctors, the police, family members, lovers, colleagues, and so on. All of which is very similar to the form of the videos being made previously by community and activist groups in the 70s and 80s. However, after some preliminary, preliminary research and archives, through discussions with peers researching AIDS activism and correspondence with activists who were there at the time, it became clear that the footage I was recalling, in fact, largely originated in the US. A gap appeared and a question arose. Were these kinds of videos even made in the UK? And if so, where are they now? In 1987, the distribution catalogue for London-based community video group, Albany Video, listed 11 videos available for hire under the heading Health AIDS. Seven were from the UK and five from the USA. And when I found this catalogue entry, the majority of the videos that originated in the UK were thought to be lost on a longer in circulation. In New York, the public library holds the largest collection of AIDS activist videos in the world with over 600 tapes, 
This archival project was initiated by AIDS activist and filmmaker Jim Hubbard in the late 1990s, for which he collected over 2,000 hours of completed works and video footage. Conversely, the closest to our equivalent in the UK, the MediaTek at the BFI in London, has 47 videos in its curator selection on HIV and AIDS. Most of these originated on television, and only 12 of these are independent productions. Seven are public health videos, so only the remaining five could be classified as alternative productions, that is, those made by artists and activists from within the community of those impacted by HIV and AIDS. In a recent correspondence with the UK-based writer and outrage co-founder Simon Watney, he explained how the whole profile of AIDS activism in the USA and the UK was radically different. I think that's important to understand that there was a reason why this work looked different and was being made differently because the context was so different, um, because the scale and approach to the epidemic was so different in both countries. American activism was largely responding to a situation resulting from the absence of socialised medicine and focused on treatment issues, whereas he explained the activism in the UK focused on prevention activism and providing a corrective to media representations of people with AIDS. The negative depiction and life-threatening treatment of people with AIDS by mainstream media meant that the need to create alternative images of and by them, by artists and activists from within the community, was as much about developing modes of self-representation as it was about education and activism. Motivated to provide these alternative images, activists, educators and campaigners understood the need to represent the experiences of those affected so they were not understood only through their illness, but to represent them as whole people. As the theorist Alexandra Yuhas puts it, as people living with AIDS, not dying of AIDS. Jim Hubbard, reflecting on the archival material he helped collect, explains how the tapes portrayed the people involved as neither victims nor pariahs, but as empowered activists taking charge of their health in both the political and medical arenas. He goes on to describe how, though this was not the whole story, it served as a necessary counterpoint to the relentlessly negative depictions of by mainstream media. American activist and writer Douglas Crimp wrote about the specific role of video for AIDS activism in his essay, AIDS, Cultural Analysis, Cultural Activism. And just to quote him, to date, a majority of cultural producers working in the struggle against AIDS have used the video medium. There are a number of um, explanations for this. Much of the dominant discourse on AIDS has been conveyed through television, and this discourse has generated a critical counterpractice in the same medium. And this is the work that I was really looking for and kind of assumed already existed. Philip Timmins, who produced a commu community theatre project with Gay Men's Sweatshop in the UK, went on to produce a series of video projects in the 1980s. These included Framed Youth, which I already mentioned, which actually began its life in 1984 as a, as a youth project, and later compromised the youth immunity in 1987, which tells the story of Peter Denner, a heterosexual hospital nurse, and Jerry Grimmond, who is gay, has AIDS, and has lost his job, home, and lover. Timmons explained in a recent interview his move from theatre to video and the urgency to make a lasting record of the experiences of people whose lives were being treated as ephemeral. He described how he wanted to redress the balance of representation by looking at the emotional lives of different people coming into contact with AIDS. And this is one of the videos that I managed to track down from the Albany video catalogue and have it re-digitised. And we, I watched it with um, Philip a couple of years ago. Mainstream television in the UK continued to represent Oh, have I missed it there? Sorry. On both sides of the Atlantic, the had to produce and distribute um, videos that represent the myriad experiences of people with AIDS was motivated by both underrepresentation and misrepresentation in mainstream media. These AIDS activist video projects are indebted to a history of cultural production that understood the necessity of self-expression, the politics of self-definition, and the power of speaking in your own voice. Mainstream television in the UK continued to represent the experience of people with AIDS as one of three characters described by Hubbard as the white gay man wasting away from AIDS, the innocent victim, and the drug, drug abuser of colour. This included programmes with the following titles, AIDS, the Victims, and AIDS, the Last Chance, Part 1 and Part 2, both produced by Thames Television. Horizon on the BBC broadcast Killer in the Village in 1983. It charts, it charts various developments um, with AIDS-related research um, and in the USA and asked whether the seeds of a spreading epidemic had already reached London. It's a series of speculations about the sources and possible cures for AIDS explained by a number of experts, rarely giving screen time to, um, to people with AIDS. At one point, a patient is shown in, in a hospital bed speaking to an interviewer, but instead of hearing his voice, we hear his doctor as a voiceover listing the various infections and illnesses the patient has. Artist, educa educator and activist Stuart Marshall stated, as far as I'm concerned, the way that AIDS has been represented by the media is nothing more than a, a sophisticated form of queer bashing. 
As a response to the majority of AIDS-related programming on broadcast television and the widespread demonization of homosexuality, by the mid-1980s, there was a move by video makers, including Sunil Gupta and the Terence Higgins Trust, towards the production of erotic, safer sex videos made to affirm the values of gay liberation. This work sought to re-sexualize gay men by redefining sexual acts and sexual pleasure. Other groups use video to document demonstrations and direct action protests, or to provide a corrective to mainstream media representations of AIDS. The production of AIDS activist video by artists is indicative of the blurred line between the work of artists and activist groups at the time. As Tom Folland has noted in his writing on AIDS activist video in Canada, the seemingly opposed agencies of video art and video activism appear, appear to be united when it comes to one political issue, putting an end to the AIDS crisis. While continually less money is being allotted for the research and development of hundreds of promising drugs, gay and AIDS communities have been utilizing video to counsel and promote safer sex, educate, promote safer sex, educate, empower, and mobilize people. To give a sense of what this looked like in the UK, the artist Stuart Marshall made Carposi Sarcoma in 1983, notably the first AIDS activist video, followed it up in 1984 with both Bright Eyes, a documentary for Channel 4 that examines the social and historical context of AIDS, and the video installation at Journal of the Plague Year. In 1987, um, well, in 1987 British um, filmmaker Pratiba Palmar made Reframing AIDS. It is comprised of cultural critics, activists, and media commentators, moving the discussion of AIDS away from the conservative and bigoted positions and instead places the focus on experiences, feelings, and activities of lesbians and gays speaking openly about how they have been affected and how they're challenging dominant perceptions. In the same year, the artist Isaac Julian made This Is Not An AIDS Advertisement, excerpts of which feature in Palmar's video, which shows the crossover between what could be considered artist and um, activist video. It consists of video manipulated to break sequences of the Grand Canal in Venice, Julian with his lover, and images of the work's title flashing in neon light, all set to a soundtrack that repeats the lyrics, feel no guilt in your desire, feel no guilt in your desire. In 1990, Anna Thu made the AIDS film poem, Eros of Erosion, and a year later, Christopher Newby made Relax in 1991. Charman completed his film, Edward II, also 91. A queer and angry, um, a queer and angry restaging of Marlowe's play of the same name, which included members of Outrage holding placard, placards and acting as Edward's supporters against Mortimer, who in turn is backed by actors dressed in police riot gear. These are scenes which wouldn't look out of place in the videos Mark Harriet was starting to shoot by Outrage actions at the same time. So by the early 1990s, with increased access to smaller, cheaper, more portable camcorders, filmmaker and Outrage member Mark Harriet, who was attending the same meetings as Jarman began to use video to document the actions of the group. As one of the only members with access to a video camera, Mark recalls Peter Tatchell, one of Outrage's other founding members, always making sure he was gonna be there to, to video the action. Outrage adopted an activist practice grounded in the exploitation of the media spectacle and graphic publicity. The videos that were being produced can be understood as fighting through video. The bodies in front of and behind the camera became implicated in such a way to remind the viewer both of their strength, but also their vulnerability. Mark recently digitized what he could, have, could find of the VHSC tapes he recorded on the Panasonic camcorder that was purchased with the funding from Camden Council. Looking back through these rushes, I find what I was looking for, what I was hoping for, footage of angry queers taking up space on the streets, outside police stations and courtrooms holding up placards. I see the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence shouting into megaphones. In one clip, I see bodies laying across the streets and stopping traffic like the actions organized by ACT UP in New York. Then I see Jimmy Somerville, who was part of the group who made framed use of Revenge of Teenage Perverts, went on to form Bronsky Beat, whose heartfelt synth pop soundtrack the lives of queers all over the UK. Then next to him, I see Derek Jarman, dressed in dark clothes, the same long coat he described previously. Later, they are seen flanked by policemen. and someone shouts, keep your chin up, mate, as they're loaded into the back of a police van. Mark's camera tracks their movements, recording snatches intermittently. The soundtrack is made up of police warnings on loudspeakers, drowned out by the whistles, chants and screams of the protesters.
Okay, did that, that just play all the way through? I'm a bit confused now. Did the video play all the way through? I'm sorry, Ed? What? Did the video play all the way through? Did it just stop? It just stopped, yeah. Oh, okay, hang on. I go. I don't know why that was. Because in my... Oh, no, it's still playing on... It looks like it's still playing on YouTube, though. So I'm confused. Reference this clip with Jarman's biography and worked out that, must, that this must have been recorded in February 1992 at an outrage demo challenging and exposing state homophobia with banners demanding equality now and gay law reform. Early that day, um, Jarman had made a speech at Bow Street before a uh, march to Whitehall. Peter Tatchell warned those who did not want to get arrested to stay off the road. As the police attempted to force protesters onto the pavement, we see Jarman, Somerville, and others lay down in the road. Reflecting later in his book, Smiling Slow Motion, Jarman wrote, I think I, had rehearsed, I think I had rehearsed this moment in my mind ever since I came to London as a student. Here I was, finally arrested for being myself in this disgraceful society. The work of these artists and the videos made by Harriet and members of POW are indicative of the way in which the multiplicity of approaches to AIDS activist video engendered myriad strategies, created urgent opportunities, and opened up spaces for communities and whose experiences and needs both intersected and differed. Stuart Marshall, who made the first AIDS Actors video a decade before Jarman and Harriet, reflected on the range of videos being made, and I quote, AIDS offers us the possibility of building alliances that do not yet exist. Our differences are to be welcomed and our similarities are to be built upon. 
Furthermore, these differences should be raised to the level of representation. Since commencing this research, I have now located 18 AIDS activist videos in the UK, made between 1983 and 1993, and hope to make as many of them possible, accessible through the London Community Video Archive website. And before I finish, I just want to thank Conor McStravick, Ryan Conrad, Simon Watney, Mark Harriet, Philip Timmins, Simon McCallum, Ted Kerr, John Grayson, and Sunil Gupta for their help and support in carrying out this research. And thanks to Mark for, um, for this and for Jonas for organizing the technical side of things as well. Great. And thank you, Ed, um, for this presentation. I had no idea that there was, um, that there was so, in a sense, so little um, AIDS activist production in the UK. That really is, is shocking to me because I know um, Simon Watney's um, work was, was kind of foundational for the development of um, AIDS cultural theory in, in the States. Um, his, mm -hmm. his book, um, uh, uh, Pleasing Desire, um, was one of the first books. Uh, Simon Watney, an art historian, who was the founder of Outrage, as we heard, the AIDS activist group in uh, the UK, um, was a key um, early thinker about AIDS and AIDS cultural theory. Um, yeah, so, so I find that a f fascinating research. It's, I mean, we have a lot of um, subjects in the room <laughs> right now um but but and so I, I don't necessarily want to try to like i don't know reduce them to some kind of common theme but uh, but there were some themes that kind of coursed through the talks that really um stuck with me um and maybe on the one hand there's this kind of gardening and also kind of gender divisions in relation to gardening and um sexual divisions we heard about the uh derek jarman's not it's not his father's garden. <coughs> That's not the model, but it's, um, I've been tested, I'm negative, um, five times this week. But um, it's not his father's garden, but it was his mother's, I forgot, I think Bishnu and Bashkar were talking about that, some reference to his mother. But also in Rahana's um, work, in Rahana's explanation of your ecstatic, your ecstatic self, um, talking about the a kind of gender division in the structure of the film and this male sexuality of the brother and then the kind of woman's care in the garden. So I think that there's, if, if I'm not misrepresenting that, but I think that there's, there's this strand in the room and then there's another thread I'll just bring in, which is um, this question I think Bashkar raised, quoting Derek Jarman about um, the vastness of AIDS. And, and the difficulty of art to respond to it. Um, and then I wonder the difficulty, is it a difficulty in the UK of activism to respond to it? Or is that, maybe that's, that's a misunder, or that's, that's, yeah. that's yeah, wrong. I, I, but maybe, yeah, you could, yeah Ed. You could, I don't think, yeah, that, that was, I don't think it's a difficulty. I think Simon mentions this kind of, there was a diff, there was like a very different context. And I think, there was a, diff a difficulty in terms of distribution because of, we didn't have the cable TV networks that were, were accessible <laughs> in the States and in, and, in, and in Canada and North America. So I think there was a difficulty in distribution. And then so where representation relied on four channels and, and three of those were representing them the, like, with programs like AIDS the Victims and AIDS the Last Chance and Killer in the Village, um, it, it really was down to like um, Channel 4 to do a lot of that work in terms of distribution. And, that, and a lot of those things were shown at like very late at night and not to mass audiences, so still very limited representation. Mm -hmm. But I think these informal networks, which I've been doing more research into, are really interesting. Like, it was really beautiful. I think um, when Rahana's brother mentioned The Fridge, I think there were like, Stuart Marshall was organizing um, screenings of like, AIDS actress videos in gay clubs at that time to sort of shift the narrative and, and to really take the way the community video works is like to take these videos into context for the people are already. So showing a artist video, um, AIDS artist video and AIDS actress videos in nightclubs was something he was doing with these informal distribution networks. And similarly from stuff from the States, like Simon talked about having like suitcases of tapes, bringing them over from Canada and the States and showing them at the ICA in London. So there was definitely this kind of mm -hmm, informal mm -hmm. distribution network, but there wasn't that same access to distribution that there was in, in the States, I suppose. I see. Yeah, and maybe um, maybe we could jump back to to this gardening 
subject exactly. in this question of gender divisions. Um, that was something that, that interested me. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. I don't know if, if Bashkar, if you would want to discuss that or Bishnu, if you had some connection to that, bringing up, because I thought that was a very interesting um, idea of the, the kind of uh, linking the, the kind of patriarchal tradition of the garden and then a kind of um, queer feminist, if you will, challenging of that, um, either in the, in the wild garden, the figure of the wild, the wildness or the wild garden, um, that, that could be one approach to it. Does that resonate at all? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. Go ahead, bud. No, you go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, there's so many connections between, uh, you know, the, ve the, the ways in which we've approached this garden uh, conceptually. Um, I was actually thinking of, there in modern nature, there are a few references to how his father wanted these ordered gardens and he took the ax and cut the apple tree and his mother would sit under the apple tree <laughs> and she sort of protested this assault on nature. Now, there's, it's a very brief references, but we've learned those traces are really important. So mm -hmm. I, I was thinking of that as a, you know, the being able to grow a wild garden as a form of being entangled. And so much mm -hmm. of socialities has been that, right? The kind of the material engagement with other bodies, with spaces, with, you know, that's a part of the kind of this animate, queer animacy. So I was trying to get at that uh, through the garden. What was very interesting to me in thinking about uh, Rahana's ecstatic uh, self was, um, you know, the, 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 you have these close up of hands, often. So I was seeing the plant as a kind of a mediator, you know, between me, the body, and the natural world. And in your film, the hands, this very tight shots of these hands, as gestures that bring and make and extend the self into the world, you know, and this goes back to the gardening mm -hmm. as well. In the garden, when we're watching gardening, it's often a focus on the hands. And you don't see, you see the people, but not so much. So I was you know, thinking about how we've all been thinking about mediation mm. itself. You know, what is it? What are the mediators? And, you know, Ed's talk with the video camera, of course, you know, like before the body camera, you had the video camera as mm -hmm, a mm -hmm. body and it mediated the world. So I think there was something about in Jarman that he's very interested in these points of mediation. What helps us cross between this world ourselves and the social ourselves and the natural so i don't know if that says anything but i think <laughs> it has something to do with that yeah no does uh rahana does i mean that that i think bishnu's elaboration of the hands as mediation um to me helps helps me um think further about ways in which um let's say both in in jarman um the he brings together let's say this queer performance and and gardening and uh, bashkar discussed it as self indulgence and self care but with with your with your film we have the um this intimate uh revelation that that your brother is making about his own relationship to religion religiosity and and sexuality and but you situate that in relation to to gardening and care care work of women yeah i mean i just, i guess when i mentioned this like the the sort of gender spectrum i wasn't trying to um assign positions at all i, mm -hmm. I guess i was trying to think about how i think it's also really critical to mention how it's racialized as well because um seeing asian women in a space that is of pleasure and um, cultivation, not not as labor, not as a plantation. You know, like it's mm. it's something between that. And so there's there is something liberatory in this act of cultivation and care and how time is being spent. Um, that is that is being queered actually. That is precisely not um, about uh, the performance and um, 
kind of conforming to a role mm -hmm. uh, it begins with that and I think for me there was there's always like a it's kind of like a tongue-in-cheek joke that we're in a car with a, a guy talking about his sexual you know that that's the starting point from which things I have unravel but I was thinking about when you were this thing around the hands and wanting to bring in I mean this has also become a uh, a way that I really enjoy filming. Um, so it appears quite a lot in a lot of my films, this fragmented gestural um, point of focus that, that in this film I really feel is about tactility as well and um, how, how the body is, how you're reading and, and being in the film through the body. Um, you know, that kind of close attention to the body, the, the movement of the hands, and that, that becomes the rhythm through which we we move through these different spaces, whether it's the car traversing wherever it's going or whether it's the hands handling the plants, which are kind of rose hips. I meant to say, Mark, the oh, red dark, things okay. are rose <laughs> Or the, the chamomile or the hyssop and, and, the, and the bay that is then burnt as a way of uh, transporting you to another place, um, like laurel. Mm -hmm. But there's something around the ecstatic that I was really struck by in Jarman's work, where this like heightened kind of these these moments, and particularly in that film, um, where you get like this kind of collapsing of the visual mm -hmm, into mm -hmm. probably different layers, but you also get this kind of pulling together of this kind of heavy religious iconography with the turmoil of the body, and everything just feels like it's really amped up to this level that it. It completely, um, you know, this like ecstatic kind of um, shattering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I kind of, yeah, I'm just, I'm really curious about how it comes back to the body or how this kind of um, hyper reality is given center stage in that. I think there's something quite profound mm -hmm. in his work around that, that I don't, I don't really see in that many other filmmakers of that time. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't actually thought about um, about that at the beginning. I mean, but the title, Your Ecstatic Self, and then I think of what Bashkar presented um, is is very, in a certain sense, is very related. This the You talked, I think, about, well, it's about excess and the excessive self, the indulgent self. Um, I don't know. It's just maybe I'm, it's... I, now maybe I'm doing this work of trying to connect these things that don't necessarily need to be so directly connected, but I think trying to think about um, of the ecstatic, the the ecstatic in Jarman, um, which is this kind of motion. We heard from Bishnu about the mobility of the necessity of mobility for viruses to circulate, but we also have the um, the kind of ecstatic presentation of the self it, through these performances in um, in the garden, and um, so if I may jump in here, I think Rana made me. me think of something that I never had a chance to talk about. Uh, you know, it's the gestural capacities of cinema that uh, Jarman is so incredibly interested in pushing and kind of almost exploding, right? And so we have the time-lapse photography, we have the flares, we have the overexposure, we have the color adjustment, we have the kind of all kinds of editing gimmicks. And, you know, like uh, at one point in modern nature, he very proudly talks about this film he made that was used as a backdrop for a Pet Shop Boys concert. And he talks about how what you see you have never seen in cinema before. Now, this is like 89. So, you know, it was pretty early in the di digital stuff, right? So I can see why he would say that, and it's remarkable. But, I mean, he's really interested in what I might call, you know, like a lot of people talk of this as the representational versus the non-representational, and I find that a little klutzy always, that distinction, but it's still helpful, but I think the two come together in mediation for me. So for instance, Rihanna, when you put your brother in the car, <laughs> it could well be that it's just a matter of convenience. So that's a good place to like talk about all this without having anybody else around. But what it does is it immediately mediates the entire conversation, as you yourself said, right? Uh, put the guy in a car, haha, talking about sex. But it's also about translation because I mean, I'm just thinking like basic physics, right? A body moves 
changes position, that's a kind of translation too. And it goes into the kind of translation that we often talk about in cultural studies as you know, doing some kind of framing or interpreting, right? And you're doing that already by putting him in the car in a way. Um, but going back to Jarman, I think uh, for me, what's phenomenal about all of Jarman, I will say, is precisely these gestural moves that he makes. Uh, it's a kind of gestural cinema that uh, absolutely refuses the stability of the subject. And here, I think, going back, Mark, to what you were saying about the vastness of HIV, mm -hmm. one might, one could even say that HIV AIDS is a complex, like many other complexes. It's a social complex. Vishnu talked about it as being an ecology, right? It's something like that. And the film, for me, does not really work at many levels because it's too over the top, too excessive. It, it tries to bring in too many things. And it just becomes campy and weird and falls apart. And he talks about that. <laughs> he himself says, it doesn't really work. It failed as art, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, it's precisely the failure that becomes absolutely so engrossing. I mean, I keep watching it, having, having not seen it for a while. I still prefer, you know, Last of England or Angelic Conversation or many of those fil other films. But it's a remarkable film because this is where he addresses in a very direct way his own looming mortality. And so the failure, the failure has to do with that too, you know? Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to say, Ed, like mm -hmm. I'm so glad you brought up this activism part because I was thinking as I was talking that God, I'm like really making him sound like, like someone who has retreated, you know, in the garden. This is obviously not mm. true. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I also felt. I kind of, I often found Jarman indulgent before I read his books. And I, and I think his films are, are that exploration of like what could be called excess or indulgence. Uh, um, but when, but I, I, when I was doing this, this editing, co editing the sketchbooks and doing research into him, like it was his anger, like um, that I was really excited about, and mm -hmm. how out he was, um, and how he talked about his illness in a way that wasn't full of fear or full of shame. He was so proud. He was he was proud until he until like he didn't like he had no regrets. And I the way he talked about sex and sexuality, and I think like um, I was always a bit unsure of his sort of like class position and like and like the, and like and the fact that he was like friends with Tilda Swinton and had this kind of like very like upper class background and and how and and how that kind of gave him a lot of privilege and access but then after his diagnosis the rate of, of production for him increased dramatically and the work he was making became really exciting i thought and and the paintings he made i, I don't know like there was something about that anger that um from reading at your own risk that really sort of got me excited about what what what, what his queerness gave him access to and i think that kind of that kind of um, yeah, pride and anger felt really like exciting to me, and I really wanted because the book was commissioned by um, Thames and Hudson, and their best-selling book was *The Garden*, which mainly was sold um, about was sold to people who were interested in garden and gardening, uh, and 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 that was and they were kind of cashing in, in on, the, on the success of that book in some way. And I think I didn't want this book to just be like a pretty book about a garden. Like I actually really like *The Garden*; it's a great book, but like I wanted it to be more like more about like the other parts of his life and so i got really excited about that side of things and and the fact that he involved the outraged people like um members in edward the second just seemed like a really beautiful bit of symmetry about the, that kind of journey um between art and activism and his own politics and um, mm -hmm. his own storytelling and like how you could take something like edward the second which maybe was quite inaccessible or and quite lofty and then make it something really sexy and political and appealing and contemporary and was where I felt because you know, like he studied classics right on the condition that then uh, with his dad saying that he, then he could go to art school if he studied something like classics. So like how he brought these different worlds together was actually where where I, I got really excited about him as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I have to mention, you know, some of you may have seen this already. Tom Kalin, I was talking to him late recently, and he reminded me of his film called uh, Confirmed Bachelor from 1994, which is again a garden film. Except on the soundtrack, what you hear is uh, from this notorious Christian fundamentalist video called The Gay Agenda, 
where they mm. graphically describe what the gays do, like you know how incredibly nasty and piggy they are, and all the kind of grotesque sexual activities. And so he kind of like plays that on the soundtrack and shows us these gorgeous, resplendent gardens, uh, often hothouse flowers. Um, mm. oh, that that would... juxtap- he was telling me how that was completely uh, inspired by Derek German's garden. Ah, interesting. That would that would be a wonderful. Uh, extension of the program to show that film. Yeah, Tom Kalin, the American director, um, independent director, is maybe most known in queer cinema context for his film Swoon um, from 92, I believe. The best and, um, American and independent. And then Savage Grace. And then Savage Grace, of course. Yeah, a little bit later. Oh, um, seven. Great. Yeah, um, maybe it would be good to see if there's any questions or comments um, from those of you who've stayed with us this evening. Um, um, yeah, if you have any comments about any aspects of the discussions, we'd be happy to hear from you. And I think um, Maryland has a microphone just so that um, our guests can hear you at home. Are there any comments or questions? It's got dark here whilst we've been talking. You found that Rahana as well. Pardon me? It's got dark here whilst we've been talking, so the lighting's really changed. Yeah, I see in um, Rahana's room it's gotten dark. <laughs> it's gotten dark here too. Well, we're like under the ground, so we we don't know. There could be an apocalypse up above and we'd all be safe and live in the world of the garden. <laughs> yeah, here's uh, one comment. Hi. <laughs> I can ask uh, one question. Um, the film... Your exotic um, self. There was the third images um, from Hunzo.com. Could you say something about it? I, yeah, I would like to know. <laughs> did Did you hear that, Rahana? Yeah, it was a, um, a question about the Hunzo.com footage and yes. your yeah. yeah, thank you for the question. I couldn't see you, but I heard you. Um, yeah, the, the material is from, um, it's, it's kind of just archive material that I found through a rabbit hole on the internet. Um, but it specifically comes, relates to sort of pre-Islamic, uh, rituals in, in Pakistan in an area that's, um, it's, it's sort of not exactly where my family are from, but kind of close to, but is a kind of ethnically contentious area. Um, which has a, a lot of minority communities existing, coexisting together in that particular, in that particular place, and it has this tradition of um, shamanic um, practice, ecstatic practice, where um, through it, specifically through land uh, rituals with the land, um, so uh, within like agricultural communities, uh, a, a shaman called a baitan is identified who will perform this ritual as a way of communing with uh, spirits and entering on, into a, a kind of a, a process with an oracle in order to forecast um, and, you know, how the community should resolve conflict or how the community might farm. Um, and I was, I guess I was interested in this particular ritual that's now become a tourist uh, attraction that is kind of detached from its original mystical um, and religious potential um, as a kind of a way of speaking to both this feeling of wanting to enter into this other cosmology uh, that's that's kind of proximate, that kind of reasserts how we might engage and think about um, knowledge making and orientating ourselves in relation to the world and landscape and um, the purpose of you know how we work with land that isn't about extraction and exploitation and and ag- agriculture in the bigger sense that it's become through like capital um but it's also i guess there's a i lost my train of thought a little bit there but yeah that that's kind of what drew me to it but also this kind of um way of trying to speak to how uh within a western tradition the, these areas have become kind of Tantra, you know, has these like associations with it that have become very much 
um, perceived through a Western lens. And even in Sajid's conversation and the way that he speaks, there is this kind of uh, shifting between uh, a resistance to, but also a, um, a kind of internalizing actually of, uh, of, a, of a, like a colonial discourse really. So I think there's a, there were, this, this particular footage seemed to resonate as a way of um, accessing these different conversations and placing it uh, and bringing it into the film. Um, and I, I found it, I find it utterly compelling as well as, um, as a kind of musical register, as a, again, this physicality of what this dance is um, and how it appears. So yeah, so it was a way of, again, sitting with this idea of the ecstatic. Um, and it felt kind of, yeah, available, it exists in public, in the public domain freely. So it's kind of, um, it's an odd, it's an odd thing. I hope that answers. I don't want to go on too much. Yes. Um, yeah. You just got a thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> Good. Are there other comments or questions? It's a little difficult with the shining light for me to see everyone. Oh, yes. There is a, another question. Yes. Yeah, question for Ed. Um, I never really realized that Stuart Marshall and Derek Jarman, of course, were contemporaries and working in proximity. So did they, uh, did they actually meet? Was there a relation between them? Do you know about this? And maybe you could say um, just a little bit more about Stuart Marshall, just for people who may not know of him. Sure, oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think that's why they made this weird map thing to try to like show the kind of context that we're talking about in a way to try to like, kind of represent it. Um, but um, I don't know if they met. There isn't there. I mean, I, they would have been aware of each other's work for sure. Um, I have and uh, Connell McTravick, who I thank in my, um, in my thank yous, he's the Stuart Marshall go to for me. So he would know more probably. Um, there was I don't think I've come up come across any references to Marshall in dramas research. I mean, um, but um, yeah, I guess they were working at the same time. Was that the and did they? Oh yeah, so Stuart Marshall um, made yeah was um, made this video Carposa Sarcoma in eighty three, which is super early for AIDS actress video. And it was only when I read read in um, Alexandra Duhas's book AIDS TV, which was um, an American title, which which also states that as one of the the first one that she had heard of, which made me think this is crazy that there's so little known about AIDS actress. AIDS actress. AIDS actress video in the UK. There's a lot, no, no, lot more known about AIDS artist video in the UK, but not this activist work. And this, I guess the work of Stuart Marshall sits really between artists and activist work. Um, and, I, and, and it doesn't exist anymore. No one can find it. And so um, i am only managed to find a clip of it through Connor, who found a, an interview with Stuart Marshall talking on this amazing Canadian cable TV show called Gable Vision, um, where he was in Canada for a film festival and they were showing... Um, a uh, couple of just like that, and there's a clip of it as part of his interview. But that's the only part bit. I've only seen a bit of it, and it looks like a lot of rostrum footage of newspaper headlines with him with him talking over the top of it, which is kind of reminiscent of what he ended up making in more documentary forms. But I think that um, that that work really like set a precedent for like this idea of inter of interrogating media representations of of, of uh, major being AIDS at the time and how to like use the form of video to kind of, um, I guess, challenge some of those, those, um, those modes of representation. Um, but yeah, I, it's, I mean, it's, I guess it's just important to think that they were, they were working at the same time. There was this group called the Lesbian and Gay Media Group that were formed um, in the, about 84, who managed to get a slot on BBC Community Programs Unit. So there was a one BBC program made by lesbian and gays about um, AIDS, which was also kind of interrogating particularly the media misrepresentation of HIV and AIDS at the time. And Stuart Marshall was on that committee as well. I don't know if Jarman was also involved. I don't think he was. And there was, I mean, Jarman's, I mean, I guess Marshall was probably at the outrage meeting, but I, yeah, I haven't, I wouldn't want to say that they had, they didn't need it, but it's a good question. And they were definitely in the same crossing over, but mainly in that, in kind of the outrage scene. And it also speaks to that kind of thing that Tom Follin says about this kind of collapsing between the artist and activist work at the time. And what was Jarman, would you consider was Jarman an AIDS activist? I get yeah, I mean, I think one after his diagnosis, um, he got really involved and mm -hmm. he did a lot of, I mean, he was, I mean, in, if you read the biography uh, by Tony Peake, he talks kind of a bit about um, how outrage might have like 
made made them made as much as they could out of Jarman's fame at the time to sort mm-hmm. of draw attention to, to the cause. And Jarman was, I think, pretty happy to do that. Like there's amazing um stickers that like um, they stuff all over cars and stuff. Like Jarman writes a lot about about how important his work with that act with that activism was. So yeah, I'd say he he became that's what I would think was interesting. Like once he had once he had AIDS, like I think his relationship with activism really changed. It was that yeah. kind of experience. I had a quick question, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Um, unless there's someone in the audience, because I've spoken loud, but it, it was to the other panelists, really. Yeah, no, it. I think um, we'd love to hear it. I think it's. Some, I'm just picking up on something you actually said to me, Mark. So I'm slightly stealing you and your mind, but um, <laughs> it's... I, uh, I just had this question, really, of what I've been trying to work out is particularly in, t- in regards to. Sort of contemporary activism around HIV and AIDS, and thinking a bit about so the charity that I was working with mm-hmm. um, was largely working with young people from of African descent, and thinking a bit about um, some of the concerns and issues that would come up within those spaces. And this is more from my volunteering there than uh, that came up in the workshops, but a lot to do with trafficking or a lot to do with you know um, safeguard. It worked specifically with young people, and I kind of was wondering in terms of both like as a historical thing, looking back, how sort of intersectional, to use a very a, a term in a weird direction, <laughs> was Jarman's activism. And I, I can't get a sense also thinking about the kind of conversations we're having around race and gender and these different um, meeting points of, of different dynamics, like where Jarman sort of sat within that. Um, it looked like you were saying about class, it, it, in when I, I've only read Dunstan Ledge, but I, I kind of am really confronted with this um, narrative of someone who is quite, actually quite middle class mm-hmm. and quite white, mm-hmm. moved through quite white circles. And so I'm th- trying to think now about also his, how would he connect with a, an audience that is maybe dealing with AIDS activism from a much more intersectional position or thinking about these questions of virus and disease and, um, the body and, and disability justice and class, you know, you know the, the multiple ways in which we can read this. And I just wondered if anybody here had, had yeah, if, if that kind of presumption that I'm making around his sort of very white, safe, middle-class, mm-hmm. uh, not safe, obviously, but um, moving through the world from that position is correct. And yeah, like how do we deal with his, the legacy of his work then when we're kind of, trying to interrogate and dismantle those those things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, I think it's a totally relevant question. It's it's one of the the things I wondered about also about the kind of institutionalization and canonization of Jarman, not not back then by the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, but but now in terms of this um the Jarman Award. Um, and also the the campaign around pros, pros, to save Prospect Cottage that Jarman, from the outside, I'm not in in England, but Jarman seems to have attained a kind of canonical status. And is that re is that reaffirming a sort of white middle class uh, male um, position? Is I mean maybe for Ed also I'm thinking like like how how to it's something I think about looking back to like ACT UP New York and trying to think through that work um, from an intersectional perspective. Um, is, is that, is, how, how would you address Rahana's um, concern mm-hmm. even looking back to AIDS activism in England? I would say it was a concern I had too, in a way like definitely around class um, and the whiteness of his world. It, it was just un- un- like I was really struck by the whiteness of his world looking back to the archive um and and yeah and then just an absence really like like of of casting of the way that he thought about the world he was making the fact that he could have that he could have been like um he could have cast differently and didn't and i think when you i don't know like yeah like his like tilda swinton's father was one of like the most decorated military people like ever like they were really they weren't just middle class they were upper class and i think drama was too and he could only afford, I mean, he bought the uh, Prospect Cottage what, after his uh, father died and left him inheritance and he paid cash for it. Like, he was definitely existing in a different world. Um, 
And I think that's why after his diagnosis, something did shift in, in, in him about vulner his vulnerability and his awareness of, I mean, maybe see it like, I don't want to be too heavy handed with it because I think it's difficult because um, he can't talk speak for himself. But like, there's definitely, there was definitely a shift, I think, about how he understood his position in the world once he was made much more vulnerable. Um, and I think that really grounded him in ways that I think made his work accessible and for me more interesting. Um, but it still didn't change the makeup of the world that he, he existed in, I don't think. Although, I mean, definitely, like, I mean, he talks, he writes about cruising and the different people, different kinds of bodies he was sleep, he was having sex with, and they're definitely not all white. The way that he, he writes about race in, in terms of his sex life is quite varied, I think. Um, but I definitely, I think it's good to have a level of, like, the under, understanding of that background when you watch his work and you understand you understand him. Um, but I think there's been, there's been a, I don't know, I, can't, I don't know if I can, I can speak really well to this, but Sarah Shulman has been talking to this recently in her, with her new book about how we can, we, how the framing of gay white men now can't be understood as how it was then, because she talks about gay white men that then being chased out of their homes, being victims, but they were like about, about what queer bashing looked like for gay white men at that time. And so she's been trying to, trying to understand how, the, I mean, she's a very contentious character, but like her, <laughs> how she's been, how she's been trying to be, talk about the experience of um, gay white men then and now, and to not try to conflate those experiences, I think in some ways, which I think is like interesting work. And I'm not, I, ha I haven't done enough research into it to feel like back one side or the other. But just to say that, like, I think it's, I, I was, I was, it was interested to hear her come out so strongly in defence in that way of that position um, as one that was, that wasn't a privilege, one of privilege, if you like. Um, uh, and I think, I don't know, I think that's kind of it was, it was, it was like another thing to think about when I, when I, when I was sort of framing drama's experience. Um, at that time, but yeah, I think that, that I think it's definitely one one that I, I consider a lot when I've been looking at his work and and how and how, well, how I sit with it now. I guess that's. I mean, I was I did a lot of work. I mean, looking. I mean, I guess I'm really like, like Pratima Palmer's work and Zuno Gupta's video, Cock, Crazy and Scared Stiff, which I've been working on, like getting re re reconstructed. Have I guess brought a different voice and perspective to that world, which I think is, mm. is really important to like mm -hmm. remember that there was a lot of other work being made as well. And I guess things would like, I think about community video and ephemerality and AIDS as all linked together and the way that these bodies were treated and the way the material was treated meant that a lot of this work disappeared. And I think trying to like tell a more, for, for a full picture of that of that time feels really important as well. So mm -hmm. that's a really garbled answer, but just to say that I think it is, a, it is it's complicated and to, and to think about intersectionality retrospectively is really complicated as well, I think. I um, I was also very interested in the Shulman actually, Ed, when you were talking about it, but because I was thinking there is this, uh, Rehana's question I think gets to the heart of it, that there is so much privilege and I, I don't think we can get around that, you know, the sort of the embodied who, what the person was, but it, I, I was thinking when Ed was presenting that instead of thinking of Jarman's own intersectional politics, whether one of the th points that Shulman makes is these uh, gay white men became these nodes. And when we actually questioned, you know, what the, their position of privilege, it brought into view a whole other public sphere of a lot of people who were fighting this, right? There were, there were people with cameras, they had access, they had visibility, yes. But if you question that access and visibility, you actually bring into being in tension, other people. And I mm. think that's very interesting because if you take Jarman as a historical note in the way that I was thinking when Ed was presenting, you have anger as a public sphere, right? I mean, there are a lot of people in that demonstration who are not middle, I mean, I don't know their class, but it just seems like a melee of a lot of people who are not quite as privileged perhaps as Jarman. And to use his presence as a way to bring into circulation all of these other communities and anger as a public sphere because our deliberative public sphere had failed. Mm -hmm. There was, wasn't discussing AIDS in, in this way. So I think there's something to questioning his lack of intersectionality perhaps as a useful, you know, mm -hmm. at this point. And maybe, maybe that, um, just as a way, perhaps to slowly bring this to a close, um, unless, I mean, I don't mean to cut a discussion short if we want to continue with it, but um, 
but we have been going it's it's a long evening um but but i'm thinking about the yeah that that perhaps then i mean there's a i th I don't know. I feel I was a little un, uncertain myself about the Save Prospect Cottage campaign and this kind of okay. um, massive amount of money in these big institutions. And I, and I wonder, like that seems to be a somewhat of a different model than the the no, Derek Jarman as a mode. And if we think yeah. of of Derek Jarman, if we do have a of if we want to have a, a critical lens to have an intersectional perspective on on Jarman <coughs> and on his world, um, maybe mapped out similarly to the way Ed was doing it in his presentation, then we would ha want to fight against a certain kind of reification of this great white man. For sure. Uh, I, I did, have, did I just say anything on that to brief? Just, yeah. Because yeah, when, 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 I remember having a conversation with Keith when he was still alive and looking after the prospect college and he said like, he would only, because he, he said he would only give, because of English Heritage wanted to buy it at one point, and he said well, I'd only give it to them if they um, promised to ban fox hunting on all of, on all of their properties. And that, that idea of using it politically was really exciting to me. But then I, when I saw all that stuff come up, I was like, Jarman would want it to wash into the sea and disappear. I don't think this idea of keeping it forever would, is in his nature. And I think, I think that would have been the ultimate, is to let it just wash away. And I, and I, and I, and I say that as someone who loves going there, but if you go there now, it's just, like it's crazy like it's like a tourist attraction it doesn't feel yeah i mean i don't know i feel like yeah just to say that i'm i'm with you on this it should it should wash away <laughs> but but i guess then watching in a sense it's it hasn't become the patriarchal garden it hasn't become his father's garden um like in the and therefore it has to we have to wash it away um or at least that would be our work um maybe in continuing if we want to get um to to continue to mine something out of um, out of Jarman's work in life, perhaps we we can uh, do it against some aspects of his work in life, um, and 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 that um, could um, yeah that that could be one productive approach. But um, I think we should probably call it an evening. Um, it's it's been really wonderful. Just um, it's it's a. It feels so intimate to have you here at this bar, um, even uh, and it's kind of this magic of mediation that has allowed this to happen. And of course, sometimes it, it kind of breaks down, but then you stuck with us and you all stuck with us here. Um, so I, I thank you. Um, but I'm so appreciative that you've all been here. Rahana, um, Saman, Bashkar Sarkar, Bishnu Priya Ghosh, and Ed Webb Ingle. Thank you so much for discussing today. Thank you so much and as well, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, and thank everyone here. Thank and I'll you. just tell you and tell all our listeners at home that the final presentation will be next Wednesday, the 18th, and that's when we'll deal more explicitly with radiation. And we're, in a sense, we're, um, we're forgetting Derek Jarman by returning to a period before uh, the garden, namely to the early 80s and the period of feminist um, anti-nuclear activism. Uh, and um, Club des Femmes will be here, uh, So Meyer and Selena Robertson, who will present uh, the film Carrie Greenham Home um, by Amanda Richardson and Bibang Kidron for 1983, I believe. And they will give um, a fantastic presentation and contextualization of that film and its importance for the development of um, feminist activism, anti-nuclear activism, and also for um, uh, feminist experimental cinema that emerged around this work. So um, yeah, that would conclude uh, Nature is Not Natural. And um, yeah, I could just say again, thank you all for being here. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you for holding out. <laughs> <laughs>